we had a great week of study this last this last week uh, and this week in particular with looking at so many of these miracles and th the work of Jesus in his earthly ministry. Um, and I think maybe um, it, it, it has really kind of overcome me in some ways with the concept or the thought that how busy he was. You know, we think about our lives and how busy we, we are. But this, I mean, Jesus, he, ne he did not have a break. He just didn't. And so everywhere he went, they were in masses. Can you just imagine? Um, and, I, and I know that for m many people, their coming was for, you know, not necessarily pure motives. It was purely for the sake of him uh, doing something for them. Um, but actually, you know, can, can we blame them? You know, if I knew Jesus were nearby, I think I'd be visiting him myself right now. <laughs> Could you heal me, you know? Um, because the physical body and the ailments that we have are, are you know, they're, they're an annoyance, but they're just symptomatic of a bigger problem, which is the, sin, the, the consequence of sin. And um, so the work that Jesus did coming back to this earth and the, the ministry and the mission that he fulfilled in proving that he was exactly who he was is kind of where we're at in this unfolding journey where we're at in our homework study right now. Last week I took you through to kind of lay out for you some definitive definitions about who the Christ is. Do you guys remember some of those things? Tell me what you can tell me just from what you re recall about who Jesus is as the Christ. Who is this Christ that they were, the son that they were looking at? The expected one is what John called him, right? And when you say the expected one or you say the Christ or you say the Son of God, you are, just so that you are aware of it, this is, uh, they're synonyms basically for all the same thing. It's all tied up. There was a passage that we looked at um, in one place where it says that he, when you do these things in my name, right, the, na the names of Christ are different are depictive. Each one has its own little quality. But in the totality of them, if you lay them all out there, just systematically lay out all the titles that you can think of for Christ, they all mean the same thing, right? The heart of it is what? Who is the Christ that came in the book of Luke? Who is this Christ? Okay, he was the seed that was promised. Do you, I do think that that's I think super important for us to kind of systemically go back to that place all the way back to Genesis chapter 3 verse 15 where in the fall Adam and Eve had committed this sin and through sin entered into the world all these problems which we now see in this gospel Jesus battling to overcome and I think that if you can make that connection then a lot of the statements that are made through here and a lot of the things that he, are, he is doing actually make complete sense because his work, his very uh, presence on earth was for the very purpose of doing what was promised back in Genesis 3.15. What was that? What was the promise to Eve? Okay, in, yes, that's, and that's in Genesis 3.15, or in uh, uh, 15, or 12, 12, 1 through 3, sorry, I, I'm going forward. That's with the Abrahamic promise, right? But what about in the Garden of Eden, what was the promise? What was the seed to do? That's right, he was to crush the head of, yeah, sounds like a video game, the crusher, homo. Um, it, wreck it Ralph, right? <laughs> <laughs> That's in a way. This is it, I see. My brain is going there again. I'm a I'm a cartoon person. So yes, wreck it, Ralph. Jesus is out there trying to wreck or undo the damage that we did in the fall, and by coming into the world, and his mission and his ministry was to take care of all those consequences of sin. The ultimate consequence, of course, is what death, physical death, right? So he overcame physical death. So during his public ministry, what, what was one of the things that he often did? Raise people from the dead. What were some of the other consequences for sin? Illnesses, right? Disease, 
sickness. So what was Jesus doing during his earthly ministry? He was healing. So are, are these kind of things kind of starting to tie together now in, in the, the, the understanding of exactly why? Jesus came not only to do those things for the sake of doing them in that they prove him to be who he is, as other scriptures teach us. Like John 14 says that, um, you know, believe on me, but if you don't believe on me, at least believe on the works that I do. The works I do prove to you that I am of the Father, that the Father and I are one. So Jesus is coming in his battling over death by resurrecting people and his healing of diseases and so forth has to do with this consequence of sin. The, a third point in it is concerning Satan. In the garden, it was Satan, but what have we seen through the gospel so far is, uh, that's relative or related to that? the demons, all the casting out of demons. So it's the spiritual warfare that he battled against. Satan, literally Satan and his children specifically, right? So again, so he's battling death and overcoming it. He's battling disease and he's curing it. He's conquering the demonic realm and casting it out. And there's one last quality then that his, is his ultimate goal in it. And it's related to one of our, pri our um, key repeated phrases, which is about the kingdom of God. What is it that he is also trying to restore for us concerning the kingdom? What was lost for us in the garden? our relationship with God the Father, that intimate daily walking with him where he came in the garden and he walked daily with Adam and Eve and they would talk face to face. Well, we lost that because of the fall. No longer are we allowed to be physically in the presence of, of God. We are now separated from God because of death. So again, Jesus returning to earth and his speaking about a coming kingdom and uh, it, the, the purpose of that coming kingdom, of him restoring that kingdom, is to restore to us our walking with God, our being physically in his presence for him, and us to have that, that intimate and continual fellowship. So that's basically four points that hopefully, if you haven't got them completely memorized, you should be able to, just by recalling what you're looking at in the book of Luke, you should be able to say, oh yeah, I see, he's overcoming what was destroyed in that uh, first record that we have in Genesis 3.15, right? In Genesis 12 then, as um, Janice mentioned, we see then that same seed was promised once again to Abraham, that God promised he would birth through that nation, a seed that would be a blessing to all nations of the earth. So in what we've looked at so far, how do we see all nations of the earth being blessed by this seed that has come? What okay, very good. So we're seeing Gentiles being blessed and receiving the benefit of Jesus' presence, even during, although he came to his own, and we, we hear other scriptures that came to his own and they received him not. But he did come to his own first and foremost. However, while he's in the midst of that, we have things like the centurion last week and his slave, and he heals him, right? We see him also work with others in the different records that we've looked at where it's not just to the Gentile, but there are Samaritans, there are uh, other Gentiles that are being blessed also. So we see that blessing going to the world. And after the cross, how much greater? What's going to happen after the cross concerning the Gentiles? They are totally grafted. And as a matter of fact, the Gentiles almost become the primary of the recipients of this blessing for a period of time. At, at a certain point in history, for those of you who have been you know, doing this precept thing for quite a while, what you know is that when Jesus returns and he establishes his kingdom, he's going to restore to Israel to her land. He's going to be, be her physical, literal king. And he is going to um, uh, reinstate, so to speak, Israel as a nation, right? All that they've lost is also going to be restored. Do you guys remember why he's going to do that? Do you remember in Ezekiel, in, uh, mostly, well, all of Ezekiel, what, what was it that he kept, God kept saying 
that he was going to do these things for Israel and not for their sake, but for what reason? That's right, to vindicate his holy name by which they had profaned among the nations. So Israel, as his people, had profaned his holy name. God tells us all through the book of Ezekiel that when he returns, when he comes back, he's going to uh, vindicate his holy name by the way that he actually fulfills his word to Israel, his promises. Okay, so we're kind of going, you can see how Luke has got really far-reaching biblically. You're talking Genesis all the way to Revelation implications that you're seeing um, come to fruition in many of its points. Now, we're still waiting for the other quality, which is that literal kingdom, right? So when it comes to the kingdom of God, another point I brought up last week, and I want you to just kind of keep reminding yourself of, is this dual concept about the kingdom of God. What is the kingdom of God? There are two qualities to it. What are they? One is the literal kingdom we just spoke of, the, when Jesus is going to come back. He, and when will that occur? Has that occurred yet? No. When will that occur? Soon we hope. Soon we hope. <laughs> like tomorrow would be good, God, right? <laughs> yeah, okay. Okay. So the secondary quality of the coming of the kingdom of God has to do with the spirit of God. Now, how does that play into this picture about him being king? How is that being, how is that secondary quality actually fulfilled? Is it already fulfilled or is it yet to be fulfilled? There you go. Through the new covenant, God has established his, his uh, or has given to us his spirit. By placing his spirit in, his, in our hearts, literally there's a reinstatement of who upon this throne. Jesus or God, right? God gets reestablished as our king upon the throne of our personal heart. So it's on an individual basis in a spiritual perspective, right? So that's where the kingdom of God, if you look at it throughout all of the gospels and really throughout the whole New Testament, often the kingdom of God, um, there are two, there are two qualities to it that you have to kind of parse out. You have to determine are they speaking of the literal kingdom that's to come, or are they speaking about the kingdom that is already here, which is in our heart? When God gave us the Spirit, what did he therefore write upon our hearts? What was written upon your heart when God gave you his Spirit? That's right, his law. Don't be shy, you guys. You do know these things. It's not, I mean, we have done this. I know, very good, Brenda. But, you know, we have done this so many times. It's just that... I think that sometimes because we do a study and we do a study and we do a study and we do a study, I think it's important to pull them all in at one time or another as we move along. It's important that you um, analyze all the things that you've studied and learned and try to pull them all together. This is where, uh, as an inductive student, you, you want to be analytical and kind of analyze all the pieces. Otherwise, what you get is you get a study on Genesis, you get a study on in uh, Hebrews, you get a study in Revelation, you get a study on Covenant, you get another study like we're doing now in Luke, but they're all detached from one another, right? What I want to do is show you how to take the thread of truth that's running through each one of those and kind of draw it in so that they all get pulled up into this beautiful little bouquet. They all have an effect of the totality of the message of God's word. So if what we're looking at is from Genesis to Revelation is God's, they, say, they call it history, right? It's his story. It's God's story of how he's going to, to reinstate us with him, put him back on the throne and when you're speaking about the subject of the kingdom of God, it has two qualities. One is him on the throne in your personal life. Because, you know, one of the, one of the passages when we did the prophet study was Samuel being told by God, don't worry, Samuel, they're not rejecting you, they're rejecting me as their king. And at that point, God gave Israel their first king, uh, Saul, 
to be king over Israel. Why? Because the people insisted on having an earthly king like the other nations. It was a failure on their part to understand the relationship that they as a nation were to have with their God, their king. Their king was to be God himself, and they rejected that. It's exactly what happened in the Garden of Eden, where instead of listening to the law of God, where God says, thou shalt not eat of that tree, right? You may eat of all the others, but not of this one. Why? This was God's law. And they broke God's law, disobeying God's law, threw him off the throne, and as setting themselves supposedly free, they actually imprisoned themselves underneath the slavery of sin and death. And so God is wanting to reinstate his kingdom rule. He wants to be back on the throne. So under the new covenant, under the work that Jesus is doing, that is accomplished individually for you and I through this, the personal relationship that we enter. When we ask him into our hearts, he says he gives us his spirit. According to Ezekiel 36, he replaces the heart of stone, gives us a heart of flesh. He writes his laws upon our heart, and he is now established once again as our king because he causes us by his spirit to walk. Does that make sense? To walk in his precepts, to obey his statutes in the way that he initially wanted Adam and Eve to do. And so for you and I under the new covenant, what a glorious thing. What did he say about um, comparing John, who although he was w one of the greatest among those born of women, right? Who did he, what did he compare that pr privileged, I guess, privileged position of John to? What did he say? Yeah, the least in this kingdom. Do you guys get that? Because we're now in a new covenant. They were under the old, but in the new covenant, we have a better ministry, a better, a better um, covenant, a, a better blood, a better sacrifice. When you go through Hebrews 8, 9, and 10, the whole thing is about how much better this new thing is that you and I are in. So you and I, even though John was great, the very least of us in this kingdom are, is greater than John, greater in that we are greater blessed. We are greater exalted because of the position that we now have. With God's spirit dwelling within us, we now have access to do what in relationship to God that was ripped from us in the garden? To go directly into his throne room and face-to-face -face speak to our God. Isn't that amazing? You, are, you may go boldly into the throne of grace. Isn't this amazing what we're learning? This is just fantastic. So if you take all these little pieces and pull them all together as you're looking at the book of Luke, don't just look at Luke isolated from everything else that we've studied, but try to find the, the threads that kind of pull it all together because these truths are um, the principles of doctrine for you and I, and if you can kind of connect all those dots together, it's going to give you a better grip on the Word of God on the whole, okay? So today what I want to do real quickly, before we move on into chapter 9, is I do want to go back to chapter 8 and tell you a couple of things that were pointed out to me by students, and I love this because one of the great things about um, the iron sharpening iron in a uh, the, these precept classes is that you all are studying deeply. This is not this is not for wimps, right? This is not homework for wimps. This is for people who want to get their doctrines straightened out so that they really know it. I love it because God says, study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not be ashamed and who can accurately handle the word of truth. The only way you're going to ever be able to accurately handle is to really study. And sadly, you don't get that by being spoon-fed. If you're just sitting and listening to other people teach you and you're not actually diving in and doing this kind of work, you're not going to ever really learn it the way you need to. This kind of discipline is what Jesus is speaking of when he tells us this week in our homework, pick up your cross daily and follow me, right? There has to be a real firm commitment, a, a, a face that's set, fixed, hard as flint toward learning and and growing in your faith walk with God to know him better. Okay, so 
Last week then, with, I said all that to now say, um, two points were brought out to me. One of the things last week we looked at was uh, this little passage in 19 to 21 in chapter 8, where Jesus is um, un unable to get around because of the crowd, and it was reported back to him, your mother and your brothers are standing outside wishing to see you. But he answered and said to them, my mother and my brothers are those who hear the word of God and do it. Now, does anybody kind of remember what we concluded about that little passage? We kind of went over it. Not, we didn't spend a lot of detail on it. But what do you know about that, Martha? Very good. Where were you last week, Martha? That's exactly it. That is exactly it because we didn't that part. Do, we didn't really bring that to the surface last week in this class. I don't think it did come up in the evening, and we kind of danced around it. One of the students brought it up. Uh, Brent, uh, Linda, uh, and Brent Henson are in the evening group, and Brent said, "Well, his ministry is, you know, I I can't exactly remember the way he stated it, but." through that conversation, my brain got thinking more on it. And all of a sudden, this is where I landed. I went, oh yeah, that's exactly right. If you connect this little statement right here, he's giving them a course correction, okay? This is a course correction. They are moving along. They are still not fully seeing him as who he really is, right? They, and they won't until the end. If you didn't catch that this week in chapter 9, that there's not going to be a full, total revelation of that somehow God, through his uh, divine purpose and through his um, sovereignty over the mission of his son, right, he's protecting the work so that it will be accomplished. And, you, and we'll talk about that in chapter 9. But back here in, in 8, it's the same thing. There's a challenge. There's a challenge between Jesus revealing who he is but also holding back enough so that his mission can be accomplished. Does that make sense? And it is a delicate balance. In part, what Jesus is doing throughout this whole thing is revealing himself to his disciples, telling them very plainly who he is and what he's about to do, as he does in chapter 9. But, but yet, they don't seem to fully grasp it. Because every time we turn around, there's another like a doubting kind of a thing. Well, let me do this and let me do that, right? I mean, they, they, their response is like, now, wait a minute, didn't we, he just say who he was? Didn't he just say he's going to go to the cross? Why are you now thinking that it's the, all about the kingdom has come now and that he's going to establish his throne on the earth today? Which we are, by the way, still waiting for. And we know it's coming, but they were expecting it in that moment in their thinking, even though he kept telling them over and over, I have a cross to go to. I must die and I must be resurrected. So when he hit this place in this flow of, of marvelous works that he was doing through his revealing of himself as the Son of God through these supernatural wonders that he performed, through the very fact that he would say, so that you know that the Son of Man has authority to do these things on earth, and therefore, by he's de declaring who he is, I am the son of God. I am the seed. I am the expected one. John had an argument, basically. Go back and double check. Is he really the expected one? Why was he confused? Why do you think he was confused? What made John need, have a necessary runner go ahead and go back and say, ask him, is he the expected one or shall we expect another? Yeah, they were, they were expecting that when the king came, he came for the establishment of his kingdom. So there's that double-sided sword of the kingdom in our hearts or the, the physical, literal kingdom. And so which part did he accomplish in his first coming? The spiritual, putting him back on the hearts of man through the Holy Spirit. And so the the. The disciples and the people of that day were not comprehending that fully. Can you imagine why? It's a complicated thing. Look at how we're on the other side of it, and we still have to study this hard to get this all figured out, don't we? Right? And yet, so these people were really struggling with this, and so as he's been doing all these things, we see last week he raises a woman's 
son from the dead. Um, John asks, are you the expected one? He says, go back and report what you've seen and heard. In other words, all these things I'm doing, all these things that I am um, uh, performing, these miracles I'm performing, the gospel that I'm preaching, this is the evidence I want you to grab hold of and look at. And then he goes, um, he goes on to uh, heal this, this woman is healed, the sinful woman who's forgiven by her faith. She's anointing his feet with her tears and with the oil that she brought in, the perfume, and wiping his feet with her hair. We see, we see all these things going on, but right in the middle of all that, then he has this little tiny statement that we looked at it in chapter um, 8 where he says his mother and his brothers came to him. They were pressing in to see him, and he says, but you answered them, my mother, my brothers, these are those who hear the word of God and do it. He was correcting them. They had uh, once again diverted back to, he's just the son of Joseph. Pretty cool, huh? I mean, that really helped me a lot when I saw that, oh, that's what that statement is really about. It isn't just about him saying, I love you all so much. You're all a part of my family, which is kind of where I went, right? But he's really saying, course correction, once again, I want you to remember, I'm not the, the son of Joseph. I am the son of God. And that's what he established all the way back in chapter 4. Okay, so that was the first thing I wanted to bring up. The second thing I wanted to bring up was, on chap was also in chapter 8, was the woman who touched the hem of his garment. Let me see if I can keep this all correct. How many of you studied pretty intently or went beyond just the, the homework cross-references on those uh, Old Testament scriptures about the, um, the garments and how they were to sew the tassels to them. What, so what did you learn, Brenda, about what was going on here when she touched? Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. And... and when you looked, did anybody look more intently at why did she think that just touching the hem of his garment would be sufficient for her? Why did she think that? Well, possibly. That is a possibility. But I think it goes beyond that. You're, you're getting close, Yes. Yeah, almost. Oh, you're, you're you're getting. You're really. You're 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 super duper close. You're getting there. So this is what I love about doing this together, because sometimes I don't know about you, but I learn verbally. So sometimes through the conversation, sometimes actually through my teaching you all, that's when new insights come to me. All of a sudden, I go, Oh my gosh, I get it now. And that's kind of what happened for me here. I had a student come to me in the evening class last week and say to me, Do you know there's a scripture verse in Malachi that says that it's a prophetic utterance? Uh, through Malachi, that when Messiah comes, there will be healing in his wings. And there, it, when you do your word study, which we did on on the on the hem of the garment, we find out that by definition, those tassels can also be translated wings. So it's a dual message of the wording. The wording can be hem of the garment, it can be tassels, or it can be wings. And so because Israel as a nation understood that when their Messiah came, in his wings would be healing, they knew that if they could touch the wings of his garment, the hem of his garment, if he was truly Messiah, they would be healed because there would be healing in the wings of his garment. Isn't that amazing? Malachi 4 verse 2, just in case you want to go and look at that one. I was elated when I discovered that and he and he brought it up to me and, and as soon as he said it I went I knew that why didn't I put those together and it's because I didn't know the word wings and the word tassels were uh, in translation the same word who the, 
this this one here? No, no, no. Yeah, the woman that touched the. Um, I d don't know. Right, right. No, well, and I'm assuming the answer was yes because that's where Jesus mostly ministered was in Galilee and in those surrounding areas. And I think that's one of the things we looked at last week was yes. In verse 26, it says, and they were in the, the country of uh, uh, Garrison opposite Galilee, and it talked about being from that city, and they went out into the city and into the countryside around. So yes, they were in Jerusalem. So she, I, the, they don't indicate that she's anything but Jewish. But the fact that she knew that. Now think about how many other scriptures where you see Jesus walking through, and they're just saying, if I can just touch the hem of his garment. Okay, read it. See, because in the doing of that, it was fulfillment of prophetic utterance. It was a fulfilling of prophecy. And she, that's my point. She knew that, and so do all those in Israel who actually were looking for a Messiah. So when they did. They knew this from the, uh, from the scriptures of Malachi and maybe others as well. I mean, I only have the one reference that, that I can go back to. But they understood, just like this week we're going to look at another quality of their coming Messiah, that when the, the Messiah came, he would do this. And then another passage, another prophecy says, and he will do this. And another passage says, and he will do this. So there were lots of things that they were looking for, markers, signs, indicators, that would give them uh, pieces of the puzzle in their thinking and understanding that would clarify to them, this is the Christ. Uh, not just the fact that he could do supernatural things that proved he was sent from God, but that he was specifically fulfilling utterances from the Old Testament prophets. And so they knew from Malachi, for instance, that when Messiah came, there would be healing in his wings. So all they wanted to do was just touch the edge of the hem of his garment. You'll never read those verses different, uh, the same after this, will you? Yes, it does. The hems of his garment, right. Yes. But she touched it by faith, believing. As a matter of fact, he says to her in verse 48, and he said to her, daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace. And back in chapter 750, he had said the same thing to um, uh, the woman uh, who cried at his feet and wiped his feet. Now, she didn't touch the hem of his garment, but the same thing there, in the, and I, this is an important point because it's going to come forward into our chapter this week. What is it that healed them both? Their faith, believing upon Jesus, and by believing that he was who he was claiming to be, then because of faith, they were healed. What verse are you in? In chapter 8, 47. And when the woman saw that she had not escaped notice, she came trembling and fell down before Jesus and declared in the presence of all the people the reason why she had touched him and how he had been immediate, she had been immediately healed. Yes. This, I touched him, it was me, and this is why. I felt the power, yes. I think it's interesting that here he calls her on the carpet about it, and then later when he talks about kill uh, or healing uh, Jairus, for instance, at the end of chapter 8 or 7 it was, right? And he tells Jairus... Don't say anything. Was that what chapter was that? Where was that at? Is that Nate also? I'm getting them mixed up. We've had so many. Uh, the man comes. 
Yeah, at the end of chapter 8. Right. She was healed. You know, and it may have had... It may have had a, a various reasons behind it, but I thought I think it's interesting, and I don't know if you guys have noticed, but sometimes he says, don't tell anyone, and other times he says, you must declare it. So then what you have to do is you have to parse through, okay, so why does he sometimes say, don't tell? And other times he says, tell me why. Make your public confession. Yeah. One of the, well, one of, yeah. Well, remember when we looked at uh, Jairus, he was himself an official of the synagogue. And that made him connected to the Sanhedrin and to the, uh, the Jewish uh, hierarchy, so to speak, of the, of the temple, right? And so word would probably get back to them if he wasn't careful. And so Jesus specifically told Jairus, don't tell anyone. So what does that tell you about what he was trying to prevent happening? Why wouldn't he want the officials of the synagogue to figure out that he's claiming to be the Christ? There was an unfolding time plan, and God says, until the appointed time comes, I don't want them to know because we don't want to expedite these things too quickly. Um, why was it important for Jesus to come and have these things occur at specific times, for instance? Why was it necessary that it be uh, at the Passover? Again, fulfilling a prophecy. He came to actually fulfill the law and prophets, right? And part of that was he is, according to John, when he appears to him for baptism, behold, what? The Lamb of God. Thank you, who takes away the sins of the world. So Jesus was literally coming to also fulfill that prophecy. So to allow the word to get out too quickly to certain uh, venues and to make it too terribly. You know, it's one thing for people to be questioning, well, is he claiming this and is he claiming that? Well, it sure looks like that's what he's doing. I sure think he's doing. That's one thing. But it's another thing to boldly say, I am the Christ. I am here. Right? And so he wasn't ready to quite do that because what was necessary? Well, we're going to look at that in chapter 9. Okay, so that kind of brings us forward, kind of lays you back out again. Again, always want to keep a balance of un remembering context of the book. What is the, you know, when you're, when you're handling a historical record, you handle it event by event, basically. So titling this particular chapter was a tough one because there were so many really big events and you, you could just pick your favorite one and title it that almost, right? It was a little hard. When you did chapter 9 on the whole, though, were there any kind of key subjects that seemed to kind of flow through the whole chapter to you? I mean, we know there's events in 1 through 6, there's an event in 7 to 9, there's another event in 10 to 17. So you have all these events, events, events. But within the events, are there any threads of similarities of message? Or were there any subjects that come up? The, okay, the kingdom of God is one thing. That The idea that he was proclaiming the kingdom of God and that the kingdom of God had, um, was being preached, okay? Yes. So twice he's okay, when he okay, so he came, what was he in what was he and he was pretty direct. He wasn't really just even insinuating. What what did he tell him was the reason he came, Martha? Okay. So he's talking about what subject? the cross, right? So it's about his cross. Did you notice my title on the board this morning? What we see going on in the whole, on, on the whole in chapter 9 is Jesus, he both is instructing and warning. Now, sometimes his instruction is through telling them, go do this. And so he's training them up because what's going to happen when that cross occurs? What, what must they do after the cross? They have to carry on the, the mission, don't they? Jesus is instituting a mission, 
which is the, it, which is the preaching and teaching of what? The kingdom of God. He, so he needs them to grab hold of the, of the passion for mission of spreading the gospel and teaching about the coming of the kingdom of God. And he's going to do it in this chapter by doing kind of a, a double-edged thing again with this sword. On the one side, what he's saying is, I am going to the cross. But then what's the secondary thing that he keeps impressing upon them through these various things? That's right. You also have a cross, right? When he, as a matter of fact, when he uh, says that in chapter 9, in verse, uh, mm, actually it's in 23, yeah, okay. So he says in 21, but he warned them and instructed them, right? Do not tell this to anyone saying that the Son of Man must do these certain things. And he lays it out. But then he follows it up, up in 23 and he says, and? He was saying to them also what? Yeah. So you have a cross also. And so to me, this is the, the key verses that seem to be that, again, there's that thread that you can pull, grab a hold of and pull, and all through starting from chapter one or verse one of this chapter all the way to the end in verse 62 is this double message that he's instructing them, he's warning them, he's preparing them, right, to pick up their cross and follow him. That one day he is going to be gone. And in, the, and in the process, he keeps telling them, I'm going to the cross. And you have a cross to pick up also. So that's where we're at in Luke 9. And that's kind of what we're going to be handling as we look at each of these events. I want you to consider whose cross is being put on display in each of these um, events or, or subjects that get brought up. Our first subject is in chapter uh, 9 verses 1 to 6. So let's do 1 to 6. So this week, instead of having each of my uh, columns having a, a different subject that we're covering or a different point, instead all I'm doing is taking you through paragraph by paragraph. We're going to look at each of the, the events as they unfold and see how they all tie together concerning the cross. Okay, so in 1 through 6, what is the major event there? He gives them power and authority, and then what does he do? He commissions them to go out. So Jesus, sends his 12 out. Now, you know, I don't know about you, but this has got to be a, a, a very interesting moment in the timeline for these disciples and the apostles also. What has been occurring up to this point concerning their mission. They're with him every step of the way. He is right there in their midst. It's like a mother with her little kindergarten and grade school kids. You know, they're, they're, they're right there, and she's like a mother hen kind of holding them close and watching them, and don't go in the street and, you know, play nice and, you know, go do this and go do that and go take your nap and now eat your dinner and, you know, ma being mothered, so to speak, through the whole thing in the very beginning. But at this point, does it seem to you on the whole with Chapter 9 that Chapter 9 seems to be kind of a pivotal switch in a focus and attention of how he's dealing with them, right? It's like all of a sudden they've hit uh, adolescence or their, their youth, their young adult years, and it's like he's, they're, start, they're not quite getting their full driver's license, but he's giving them a, a permit, you know, a driver's permit, you know, and so he gives them per, uh, sort of a permit, he empowers them, he sends them out, and, he's, and then what, when they're done, what do they do? They come back and do what? And report back into him. It's just like a teenager. You've got till midnight. If you're, if you're one minute past the hour, I'm coming looking for you, right? Daddy says, right? So this is really kind of what we're seeing going on here. In this moment, we're seeing a pivotal move where Jesus is beginning to kind of let go of the reins a little bit. He's empowering them to go out and begin to do things. He wants them to grab hold of their own mission. He wants them to get a passion for the work that's ahead for them. And so he's allowing them to grow up just a little bit. So what, do you, what did you see there? Let's talk about this. One of the things that you see 
just in those first six verses, I want us to just talk it through. Tell me, Jesus is teaching them basically to walk by faith, right? So what did you see in what occurred in those six verses? What was he teaching them? <laughs> Learn to walk by faith. I sure wish these markers were... Can anybody see that in the back? You can? Okay. Okay, tell me what... Okay, you said to travel light. Okay, and what does that teach them systemically? Yes, travel. He literally said, don't take these certain things with you, right? Why not? What is he teaching them? That God is going to provide. Yes. So I want you to have full reliance and trust on God, right? Okay. Don't be encumbered by, the, that's a good one. Don't be encumbered. I, it makes me think, there's one in, uh, is it Second Timothy? Did I do something? Thank you. Let's try a better marker, huh? That's a brand new one. It just stinks. Thank you. Okay. Um, there's, it's, I think it's in Second Timothy where he, it talks about like being like a good soldier or being like the farmer or being like, but one of the ones about the soldiers don't be tangled up with the world so that at any moment, at, a, at, a, at an instant, your commander can call you to duty and you can drop everything and go because you're not encumbered by the world. So that's a good one. I like that. Okay. Full reliance and trust in God. Don't be encumbered. What else? Um, don't be, t uh, don't be weighed down. Ooh, I like this one. <laughs> Except now you can see all my misspells. <laughs> don't be, maybe don't be weighed down. It wasn't one on my list, so I'm just going to, yeah, don't be entangled <laughs> or encumbered or entangled is another word for it. Okay. Okay. What? Okay, go to the next thought on this. What else is in there that he's talking to them about? And, and I, so what we're doing is we are taking what is being literally said, because you could make a, what they call a topical list, right? I don't know if you did do that or you did not. I hope you did. If you make a topical list on what he says in one through six of what to do and what not to do, right? Now what we are doing is we're taking that list and we are analyzing. We're saying, so what is the truth quality that he's trying to convey to them? What is he trying to teach them by telling them, don't take this and don't take that and do, and do it this way and don't do it that way? What are the truth qualities? So we are analyzing. It's called an analytical list. If you go into your how-to study book, there's a section in list making. Um, it should be in chapter three, I think, but it, it, and in there, it'll tell you all these different kinds of list making that you can do, and one of them is called analytical, and analytical is that next level of depth. You go from looking at the literal facts on the page and saying, okay, it says do this, do this, do this, do this, and you just make a list right from the text, but now we're analyzing it, okay? So analyzing what you're looking at in verses 1 through 6, tell me what is Jesus teaching them about their faith walk, about learning to walk by faith. Okay. That's why that's there. You're right. The, I was going to say that, but I didn't want to interrupt her thought. But yes, yeah. The, anytime there's either italics or brackets, it's either it's either wasn't there in a previous um, writing, an earlier document, and they've added it in for clarity, or or it was added in later by other um, translators, or it's there for for us to have better understanding, a better translation of it. But Okay. But there is something in three. What's going on in three? No, no that's not what you're going to say. Okay, go ahead. Okay, good. I didn't study it out, but what is a staff of bad bread, money, and tunic? You know, like what are those? What are those? If you're traveling, how important is a staff and a tunic and a whatever? 
That's your normal stuff you need every single day. So if you're going to go on a journey in the work for, for God, if you and I as his children today are going out into the world, sometimes he doesn't, he does, maybe you don't have those things available to you, right? And you're going to take a, a step of faith, right? You're going to step out on faith, and what are you counting on? Yeah, it is a big step. Well, it can, absolutely. Can you see that that would have been so for these apostles in that day? They were leaving home, and it's not like they have a McDonald's on every corner they can whip into and pick up their dinner, right? They are literally walking from town to town, village to village, and what does he tell them to do when they get into these villages? Right. So you're counting on God to do what? To have your back to cover it. And so this, would you call this any sacrificial? I mean, you are really giving up all your reliance upon the things that you can provide for yourself, and you are really trusting that God's going to provide for you, right? It's also, it is a, a sacrificial kind of uh, life. What if God doesn't provide you a place for your head that night? Do you remember Jesus later says, the Son of Man has no place to lay his head? How many times do you think he and his disciples actually slept out in the garden somewhere, right, under a tree, camped out, so to speak? So would you call that a sacrificial kind of life, a kind of living that, that is willing that if God doesn't provide, that you will just sacrifice a little bit that night it may it may not be in the lap of luxury every time you go out to serve God he's not going to always provide every one of your needs even though you seem I think that sometimes we put God in a box we say well God I'm going to serve you and I'm going to trust you that you're going to provide all these things right here inside this little box of mine I need this and this and this and this I'm going to trust you that you're going to give it to me what if I get out there in the midst of serving him and one of those things he doesn't provide that day. Yes. Okay. All right. So you need to be willing to live sacrificially. Mm-mm. Not yet. Okay. That's next. Okay. Mm-hmm. That's going to be in uh, 10 to 17. Mm-hmm. Sacrificial, li- a life of suffering. That's just willing to suffer. It may not be that you always will suffer, but be willing that, ha- it, you know, th- think about the ministries that you are doing right now today in your life. Not know what y'all totally are are into I know where my ministry is I can I can truthfully say when it's not it's not for the sake of saying poor me but there are times when I sacrifice I give up other things in my life to sit at my computer and do the work that I do to be prepared for this work that God has given to me and sometimes what God says is sometimes I won't make you sacrifice but sometimes I will why do you think that's true There you go. Good job. This is, when, he, when you look at this list on the whole, and there's more, but if you understand that you are stepping out in faith, walking with God, when Jesus sent the, the 12 out, um, we see in the other Gospels, he sends them two by two, so they don't go along, which is, I think, an, a, a quality of grace and so forth. But he is asking you to fully rely on him and trust him for provision. And he's saying, and when I don't provide, trust me in that too. And sometimes he will allow you to do without in order to do what? What happened with Jesus when he went into the wilderness? He was tested, wasn't he? 
And so testing, what does testing do for us when, we are, when our faith is tested, when our perseverance is tested? Yeah, in the history of your whole life. <laughs> I remember that. <laughs> like, God, what are you doing? <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So how, what does that do for you, for you as his child? You know, what, is this, what does the scripture teach us about the purpose and function of uh, difficulties and trials and testings? That's right. In the end, what he really wants is you to walk close to him and to trust him more, right? It's also a proving of your faith. Did you know that? That through, through you persevering, it is evidence to everyone around you that you have a real commitment to the Lord. It's a conversation I've had with my son a lot, and he, he tells me this on a regular basis. He said he can tell who really knows God and who doesn't just by those who are willing to actually endure in the suffering, who, who stick it out through thick and thin. And that is really the essence of uh, a lot of what goes on in the, the trials and the testings. So when the, when the 12 were sent out, they were sent out with nothing. They were told basically, count on God to provide for you. Look for these things, right? When, you, when these things are given to you, I want you to stay in that home until you're done and then move on, right? And, and he basically tells them... Um, Whatever house you enter, stay there until you leave that city. And as for those who do not receive you, now what is the message there? Yes. 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 Very good. You. That is exactly. Yes. Right. I'm really glad that you mentioned that particular verse because I I would have forgotten to bring it up. Um. One of the things I remember seeing when I was looking through some of the readings was do not ever box God in. Don't ever look at one passage and say it has to be done this way or, or it doesn't work because God, God does change his mind later. In one place he says don't tell, another place he says do tell. In one place he says don't take anything with him, the next time he'll say, now I want you to take this and this and this with you. So there are times when... Um, God will say one thing, but other times he'll say another. So what, what is in that message for us? Listen to the leading of the Holy Spirit. There is a leading of the Spirit in each moment in you and I. So this is the practicalities of kind of what we're looking at right here. We're taking this down to the, to the, the meat and bones of how does this apply in my life? How is what I'm looking at with what Jesus is doing with these 12, how does this apply to me, right? And the, the point in this message, I think is number, it's kind of twofold. Number one, Jesus is literally training them up. He's, he's maturing their faith. When you get to this place in your faith walk with God, you're beyond those baby years of being an infant in Christ and being just spoon fed everything. And he's starting to say, okay, now I want you to start walking by faith. I want to see you step out and start doing some things. I want you to, to be fearless in doing it.
general excuse to carry a private to go to a major and give that man an order and if that major does not respect what came through that private, he's going to be brought up on charge. That's exactly right. Yes. And I'm super happy you brought this part up too about what it was, because we hadn't really mentioned it. What did Jesus do right at the get go in verse one? He gave them power and he gave them authority. Well, specifically to, uh, that's right. And to, and to even over all demons as well. So the demon the, it, it was included with the healing quality of it. Yeah. So you go therefore and proclaim the kingdom of God and perform and do those performings of healings of various kinds. Um, when we move forward in this, we hit a place where they're about to feed the 5,000. We're going to get there after we look at Herod just very briefly. But what is the problem with them when you hit verses 10 to 17 concerning this subject of authority having been given to them. What were they? You know what's really funny? You know what this makes me think of? This makes me think of, I don't know how many of you guys, I know a lot of you in here have, but you know, you raise your kids, they move away, they go off to college. So let's just say college. And what happens as soon as they come home from college for their first visit? They revert back to their, they're sitting on the couch and they're waiting for mom or dad to wait on them. And you're thinking, now, wait a minute, how did you manage to even get fed all this time you've been away at college, right? Or maybe your child left for a period of time and for whatever reason they've had to come back and, and live under your roof again for a period of time. But very, very quickly, what do they do? They fall right back into the old habits of total reliance on you for everything. They become a baby again, Right? So here, this is kind of what we're going to be seeing happening here. So I want, I'm happy that you brought up the fact that he wants, in this learning to walk by faith, he wants them to trust and exercise the empowerment and the authority that God has given to them. And for you and I to grow up in our faith and to really grow in our, the exercising of our spiritual gifting and to, um, and to really grab hold of whatever ministry God has given to us, these are some of the qualities that he's looking for. So he's trying to grow these up in his, his young disciples, these 12 that he has sent out. And when we hit this next section, it almost like they came home, they reported in, and then they were reverted back to childhood again. <laughs> and, it's, and it's visible for you. It's really kind of funny when you look at it from the human quality of parenting and, and the nurturing that process that goes on and how you're trying to grow grow someone up and this is literally we are looking here in chapter 9 Jesus is making his attempts at this point to grow them up and mature them to the place so that they are ready and prepared to walk in faith by themselves without him when he goes yes mm-hmm well, we're going to talk about that in just a minute because that one, I think, relates to a, another piece of the puzzle. I don't think that actually has a lot to do with the disciples. It has something to do with the, with the, the, other, the other parts of it. Hang on to that thought for a second. Okay, so, yes, Susan. Well, I think Jesus empowered, this is a lesson for them, that God's going to empower you to do things that you can't Yes. That's right. That's a really good point. You know, God does not compartmentalize himself in one place of your life and not in another. He, when he comes into your heart, he's Lord of your whole life. Both your mission, your ministry, and your personal life, your home life, and your intimate internal life. He wants to work in your personal heart and mind to, to grow you up in him, and he wants to have an effect in all aspects of your life. So in many ways, what they're learning to do here is both, an, and one of the things that he said in there when he opened it, and it says, and he called the 12 together. Now, why did he have to call them? Where do you think they had been? 
D- did anybody even kind of think about that at all? Do you think the 12, when they came to work with Jesus in his three and a half years, that they were always present with him 24-7 for three and a half years? So where maybe have some of them been that he had to call them together? At home. How about with their wife and kids and maybe providing for the, the practical everyday things? And this is true in you and I's life. You and I have missions. We have ministry, right, whatever your ministry is. But you also have a personal life. And God is in it all. And he wants to be Lord in all of it. And quite honestly, these qualities of learning to walk by faith apply both in your personal life and in your ministry life, right? But would, could you say with me, by just looking at this, what we see here is Jesus is teaching them to basically pick up their cross. This is about them learning to pick up a cross daily and follow him, right? Because he's going to actually verbalize that later, but here we're seeing him. This is their cross. He's, he is teaching them about their cross in this particular first uh, six verses. Okay, any other points on that? Pretty cool little spot. Let's move on to the next one, seven to nine. Now, Kay asked us to, to just kind of look a little bit about Herod and who he was. What did you all learn about Herod and um, what's going on here with Herod? <laughs> Okay, he is confused. What is he confused about? (laughs) So Herod had heard about Jesus, right? And what was his question? I know. So he's a little bit confused. He's like, okay, maybe this is, actually there were were, uh, three little things. Maybe this is John, that he's risen from the dead, right? Or maybe it's who? Elijah, the prophet. Why would they think that? He's supposed to come back. Again, this is really important. Again, one of those things that's kind of like what we said earlier, touching the hem of the garment. It was a prophetic utterance that people were looking for. They knew he was coming, and they're thinking, well, maybe this is the Elijah that's supposed to come back. They're remembering a prophecy about the kingdom to come and what's supposed to occur at the end. And sadly, they're merging the second coming and the first, but they haven't quite split the hairs on that yet. So they're saying, well, maybe it's Elijah, right? And then what else? Or it's one of the other prophets of old that has risen again, right? Maybe it's one of those other prophets. So he's a little bit confused. So what is his question? Who is this man? So that's the question. All right, who is this man? All right, when you think about, but what is Herod's interest in him? What do you think is his interest? Although he has these questions, <laughs> quite honestly, it probably is, is a real, it's just politically motivated, right? And it, um, it probably has a lot to do with just worldly curiosity. One of the other passages talks about him wanting Jesus to come and do miracles for him, right? Did anybody else look at that? Right. So he was just kind of interested in seeing the spectacularness of, oh, I want him to come and do a miracle for me, right? As a matter of fact, Jesus reprimands a lot of the Jews in that day for that very reason. You all just want miracles. You just want to see a miracle work before you. So in some ways, Herod's no different than the rest of the world, right? Okay. So Herod is just mentioned, but he poses the question for us. He lays out two or three options that the world is considering. Maybe he's this, maybe he's this, maybe he's this. He's not really sure. Um, Herod certainly has a vested interest because what is Jesus possibly a threat to him about? Yeah, absolutely. There, there had to be a real tangible, and certainly it is true, that when Jesus comes, all the kingdoms of the earth are going to be overthrown, and Jesus is going to be established as the, as the, the sovereign ruler over all the earth, right, in that day. 
It's one of the pictures that you see in Daniel's vision with the stone that comes and crushes the statue. That statue, all of its pieces represent a different uh, kingdom throughout the ages, right? And all those kingdoms are going to be crushed, and then what's going to come from it? A great mountain, right? And he, it will fill the whole earth. And, what, and it's saying and he, it is God then that is going to be king over all the earth. It is this Christ that's coming, the seed that is promised right? Okay, so Herod has a legitimate cause to be worried. When this kingdom come, it's going to crush all kingdoms. Guess what happens to Herod? He's ousted. It's really the same battle that he had with the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Why were they so upset about Jesus coming? They would lose their power and position. If the temple is done away with, if the temple sacrifices are no longer necessary because the ultimate Lamb of God has come and there's no longer a need for them, they lose their power, they lose their position. And so it was a personal threat to their power and position. So they didn't like that. So here we see Herod's interests are basically, they're purely political, and there is some worldly curiosity in it. If you want to look at that, it's in Luke 23, 8 to 12, is that reference to that. You can take a look at that. But that poses, what we see here in 7 to 9 is a, a question posed and laid out for us some, some things that are... Uh, being considered by the masses, by the population. Now, what follows it is in 10 to 17. Um, do I have room down there? Probably not. I'm going to have to go over here. 10 to 17. And what happens in 10 to 17? What did, what did you title this section? The feeding of the 5,000. So Jesus feeds... I got to tell you, this one was a real eye-opener for me when I really dug this out and did some research online about this. I had to do some historical um, uh, Googling, basically, is what I did. I Googled through the Internet and just kept Googling on this, and I just kept popping op open lots of different... Um, sermons and different writings on these things and uh, some of them had to do with Hebrew background insights and things like that and eventually I was able to take little pieces of everything and kind of pull it all together to really grab hold of what was going on here. So let's talk about this 10 to 17. Why is 10 to 17 here? Um, what, and by the way, what follows it in uh, 18 to 20? Again, that same question. Who is this man by Herod, right? Heard had heard. heard. <laughs> I should have been Herod. H, hold on. H E R O D. Herod had heard about Jesus. Who is this man is his question. And we are going to see in um, 18 to, tw is it 21? 18 to 20. Okay, I know I did my, my divisions a little different. I'm sorry. But here we see Peter, Peter's confession, right? And it's the answer. Here's the question, and then we're going to see the answer given to us here. Sandwiched in between is this. Now, this was significant to me to look at it this way, and the reason I'm showing it you in this manner is that you know, if you remember uh, in chapter 1 where uh, Luke tells us he, he's giving us this in consecutive order, right? So there's a rhyme or a reason why he presents things in the order that he gives and why he gives us what he gives us, correct? He's trying to accomplish his goal of presenting to us Jesus from the perspective of what he's trying to teach. So when you're looking at this flow of thought, what you're seeing is a question is posed about who Jesus is. There's this miracle of him feeding the 5,000, and then you come back and you see actually an answer. Kay had you compare those two things. She says, compare what Peter's questions are to what Herod's questions were. Did you notice that in your homework where she tried to connect you back 
in, in her line of questioning. She wanted you to compare, did you see this before, I think was her question. And the answer is, oh, yeah, I did. I remember that Herod asked these questions, right? So when, P when Peter a asks the questions, he says, who do people say that I am? And they said, oh, John the Baptist, and others say Elijah, but others say it's one of the, pro the prophets of all that has risen again. It's exactly verbatim what, what Herod had said, right? And then Jesus says, but who do you say that I am? And now he gives them the answer. He is what? He is the Christ. Um, he says, uh, the Christ of God. So here's the question. 5,000 right in the middle. Why? Why? What happens in that, in that feeding of the 5,000? Okay. Goes back to the one week of it where it says, you know, okay. take care of everything. Good. I love that you're catching these connections because this is really important. One of the points, it's almost has, there's a couple of things going on here. One of them is this quality where um, what we see with Jesus' feeding in the, with the 5,000 is it's kind of a reference back here because back here, what had they been empowered to do? Exercise, empowerment, authority that God had already given them. What had God given them a, p a power and authority to go do? To cast out demons, to preach the gospel, to do basically to, to work miracles. Yes? Okay, if you, can, if you can cure somebody of leprosy or, or, you know, bring them back to blind, if you can cast out demons, why couldn't they provide food for the people and why were they so hesitant? What was going on with them? Okay. I don't know. That's just maybe, I maybe. I actually did see that in some of the commentaries where they kept throwing out the possibility that, you know, well, m maybe they didn't even want uh, to feed the 5,000. They were just what read, I kept, I know I kept reading that and kept saying, but it doesn't say that and it doesn't even indicate that anywhere. And that's a supposition that, that commentaries are just bringing into this picture, right? So I w I'm not sure. Okay, good job. It seems like this does seem to be a unique uh, miracle. I, is that correct? Are you seeing that? This is a kind of a unique one out of all the others he's done. This one of feeding the multitudes is, is very unique. Why do you think that's unique? And do you think there's something profoundly interesting about the, that fact? I'm sorry, go ahead. Janice, go ahead. Oh, Becky. Yeah. Okay. To me, that's what made me do what, what Terry did was go back to verses 1 through 6. Now, wait a minute. He'd just already given them authority and power to do all kinds of things. Why didn't they just say, hey, he already gave us his authority and power. Let's just feed him. You know, he, they, they could have prayed and done it. Now, a lot of little tidbits in here. What does Jesus do um, w just before he begins to create this miracle in verse 16? He took the, the five loaves and he took the two fish and then what did he do? He looks to heaven and then literally as he's looking to heaven, he's taking those fish and he keeps throwing them out and the bread, right? The, the multiplication miracle is literally coming out of the hand of, of, this, of Christ at that point. The, the uh, disciples are seeing this miracle literally falling from his hands right? But what Jesus has demonstrated to them is what? Who did Jesus go to? To God the Father also. So what is he teaching them in that? They need, they, that was one of the things they failed to do was go back to God the Father, right? What was it again that he was trying to teach them back in one through six? Full reliance on God the Father for provisions, right? Verses one through six. 
now we're in verses uh, 10 to 17, and they're up on this mountain, and there's this multitude, and they're hungry. And what is their, the first thing that they do when they have a need or, or a, for a provision? They run back to Jesus like a, like a 10-year-old or, or a 5-year-old saying, Daddy, <laughs> right? They don't even do that. They say, we need to send them away. Yeah, well, yeah, that's true. Well, so there was doubt. Even in that, my question is, why wouldn't they just go to him and say, Jesus, you need to do a miracle for us? I mean, that would have at least been a little closer to a mature response, right? Maybe, too, they didn't um, understand his power. It's kind of like us sometimes where our little things is like nothing compared to his big things. Yes, that's real true, too. You know, it's really interesting, though, because think of how many miracles he's already performed for them right before their eyes, raising people from the dead for Pete's sake. I mean, really, he, did, he just raised Jairus' daughter from the dead, and before that was a young boy who was already dead and on his way to the, to the tomb, and he raises him from the dead. And so we're worried about Jesus providing food for 5,000? But how much more difficult is this to, to raise someone from the dead than it is to, right, I know, yeah. Yes, so they, so what were they looking at? What were they, what were their eyes set on? The earthly obstacles, the things that were difficult. They were, they weren't seeing the possibilities and, Right. They saw the challenge, but not the provision. They weren't walking by faith and relying on God. And they never once stopped and said, let's ask God. Right. And Jesus, this is the great thing about this whole chapter is it's all about him training them. He's training them up to know what to do and how to handle it when it occurs. One day he's not going to be there for them. So he's showing them by demonstration, he himself, before he, do you think Jesus needed to talk to the Father for, for him to be able to do that miracle? No. So why was he doing it? For their benefit. That's right, as an example, to teach them. You need to tap into God the Father. You need to rely on him. When you, when you see the obstacles before you, don't run in panic, right? Don't go crying to mommy and daddy. <laughs> so to speak, right? Not that we're belittling them in any way, but I'm just trying to show you what is being demonstrated through each of these records. Remember, Luke is giving us an account and an account and an account, and he is progressively, he says, in a concise fashion. He is unfolding for you so that you can see progressively how Jesus is being portrayed, how, how we're learning about who this Jesus is from the perspective of what Luke wants us to know. And he's showing us progressively how Jesus trained up his disciples. So he spent those first years nurturing and holding them close and doing everything for them and demonstrating it to them, preaching the gospel, doing miracles, right? Then he gradually steps back and he says, now you go. He gives them a little bit of, you know, leave way. They go out, they do stuff, they come back and they're reporting. Apparently, they must have had some successes, right? They don't really go into detail in it, but it does show that they come back and report. There must have been some successes they had. But then the very next report that we get in this succession of consecutive uh, accounts that are given to us is this deal where the feeding of the 5,000 is needed and they get stumped immediately. So I saw a little bit of connection back to verses 1 through 6 in it. But now, secondarily, the other thing that I thought was really cool about this, this is this. Um, um, this is a powerful demonstration of a unique um, miracle, this unique from all the others. And my question is, why this miracle and why was this so profound? And one of the things that caught my attention was, did you know that this miracle is recorded synoptically in all four Gospels? It's other than the death, burial, resurrection of Jesus, which is recorded in all four. This is this one, and I think the four might be the four thousand one also. There's a secondary feeding four thousand, but it it's repeated. It's the only one of the miracles that's recorded in all four records. Why? 
Why wasn't something like resurrecting someone from the dead in all four records? Okay, now say that again. That's You are really close, Martha, because you and you're dancing right on top of the of the right scripture thinking here. You're hanging you're getting really good. You're getting close. Okay, so it has to do with the prophets. What's going on here? There you go. Okay, good. Good. Okay. Mm-hmm. Okay. Let me. I don't know. I don't. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> sorry, Lisa. <laughs> I haven't looked at that one. No, that one. Is, I know there's walking on water. It falls after this. I did figure that one out. <laughs> and it's not. But you know what? The walking on water. That's a pretty big deal, but that's not in all four Gospels. But did you know the feeding of the, of the 5,000 is in all four Gospels? Why is that profoundly important as a demonstration of, the, of who Jesus is to every single one of the records that are portraying Jesus in all their various forms? Why is feeding 5,000 significant as a witness? You know why? Because it was a prophecy being fulfilled. Again, just like in the the wings of his of uh, in his wings shall be healing, it, this is again a fulfilling. This event right here fulfills a profound thing. Let me just write what I how I did it on my paper here because it'll be better than me trying to think it up again. Okay, so Luke records in consecutive order to answer Herod's question first by a powerful demonstration of who he was. He was the expected one, just like where John the Baptist asked the question, is he or, or should we expect someone else? No, he is. He is the coming king and the kingdom was upon them in full display in this miracle. Now, as Gentiles, we may not grasp the power of this specific miracle that's been recorded, but for a Jew, this miracle is a game changer. I just want you, to, we don't get it, but I want you to get like really excited about this particular miracle. I want you to note it in your Bible as a game changer or as a very, it's a, almost a stronger thing than the resurrection from the dead that he performed with other people. You don't see that recorded in all four Gospels, but this one you do. He says he fulfilled well-known prophetic scriptures by this specific miracle, which may be the exact reason it is specifically recorded in all four of the, of the Gospels. Now, I want to give you some verses. Who would like to read? Uh, Psalm 146, 7 to 10. Who would like to look at that one? Good, John, thank you. 146, 7 to 10. All right, uh, Isaiah 25, 6 to 8. Thank you, Lisa. And so you're forgiven. And Lisa, <laughs> and uh, one more, Isaiah 40, 10 and 11. Who's got that? Somebody? Okay, okay, thank you. All right, so now we've got all three of those. We're going to go back and look at these because in these texts that, I'm, that I've given to you, and I've only given you a few, there's others as well, but one of the most important qualities for Israel, and you've got to think about it in the historical time where people were hungry on a regular basis, right? And they lived bread to bread and day to day for their food. And so the coming king is going to be a king who is going to feed his people. And this was actually a significant quality that was kind of like one of those indicators or those signs that they would be looking for when their king came. They, they would identify him by the fact that he would feed Israel. Okay, so let's read Psalm 146, 7 to 10, Don. Thank you. 
Wow. So in that particular one, it actually takes you all the way from the beginning where it talks about him feeding, and it takes you all the way then to the kingdom. And what, what that, whole, the pa- that passage in its totality does is it connects the two qualities together, that the king who's going to come, who will reign forever, is one who will feed his people, physically feed his people, okay? Now go to Isaiah 25, 6 to 8. Lisa. Okay, that's a, okay. What translation is that? What trans? Yeah. What is? Your, yeah. What is your translation, though? What is your Bible translation? ESV. Okay. So the wording is just slightly different, but it's good. So tell tell me what did you see in that? What what did you pick up on that does what I just told you? That he's going to prepare what for them? A feast or a banquet for them? Okay. 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 And does it talk about the kingdom in that particular one, or is it? It might be before. Oh yeah, that's a really good one too. There we go. There we go. Okay. So he's the Lord God. Okay. So he's the one that's. So it shows him as the Savior. And as we now, as we know from looking at um, this title of the expected one, um, or as the Son of God, that he is one who will be both King and Savior, right? He's going to bring forgiveness of sins, which is why John the Baptist came preparing the way, right? For the heart, for the forgiveness of sin. Okay. So. Okay. Okay, very good. Excellent. Okay, now Isaiah 40, 10 and 11. I think you, yes, ma'am. Please. Wow. Okay, another prophetic utterance about the coming expected one or the coming son of God and that he will tend his sheep like a shepherd. Now, we've talked about this lots of times through other uh, uh, New Testament studies where we see Jesus portrayed as the good shepherd, right? Like John 10 does does that also. Um, And that was a quality that was expected. So when Jesus came and fed the 5,000, this was fulfilling prophecy. Now, isn't that interesting? So what we see is we have Herod ask a question about who is this man. The next thing he gives you in the account is he gives you, he demonstrates to you Jesus fulfilling not just a prophecy, but a really powerful, specific prophecy that, by the way, for people, especially in that day where they did live day to day, hand to hand on their food, this quality that they're that their expected one to come is one who is going to feed them. And so when Jesus fed the 5,000 in such a miraculous way, very supernatural and powerful way, they saw this as, a abs- as an absolute evidence that he is the coming king. Pretty cool, huh? So this fulfilled, he fulfilled prophecy. feeding them. Okay, that was really powerful. So those those verses in Psalm and I and those two in Isaiah that we looked at. Now Psalm 146, 7 to 10. And, you know, if you do research on this, you probably find a lot more. I mean, this is just a few. But there, there are tons of verses where he is going, he, where the coming Messiah will be prophesied as the one who's going to tend his sheep, 
right? He, or they're like a sheep without shepherd, for instance. They talk about that also as another thing. We, we see him literally as being the lamb of God as well, but specifically that he's going to be a provider. Now, the flow of thought is really beautiful. He sandwiches in between Herod's question, who is this man, and Peter's answer, he is the Christ, with a display of evidence that he is the expected king and savior of Israel. And on top of that, he also performs, again, another supernatural miracle. Go to John 10, uh, or no, John 14, and look at 10 and 11. Who, wa- who would read that for me? Somebody? One more verse. Yes, uh, 14. John 14, verse 10 through 11. Okay, so in that particular passage, he literally, he, Jesus himself in John says, look, even if you don't believe the things that I'm saying, right, you're not believing the message that I'm giving you, look at the miracles I'm doing. These miracles are evidence that I am in the Father and that the Father is in me. These miracles are the evidence that I am who I claim to be. Even if you don't want to believe my words, look at what I'm doing and believe that. Does that make sense to you? So again, two things get sandwiched in between. The question about who is this man and then the answer, you are the Christ, is the fulfilled prophecy of him feeding them. That's what the king was supposed to do when he came and they knew that. And also the fact that he yet again performed a supernatural, powerful miracle in their sight, which again is evidence that he is who he was or, and who he claimed to be. So then when Peter's confession is recorded next, does this actually make sense to you guys about the, the, the flow of thought here? It's pretty cool, isn't it? All right, so he gives the answer, you are the Christ. Now, when he says you are the Christ, Jesus warned his disciples, do not tell anyone about this revelation, right? Why does he say don't, don't tell anyone? He says, don't tell anyone. Very good. Now, we can uh, list all of the points. He says, number one, I'm just going to do it this way. One, he must suffer. Number two, he must be rejected. Has to happen. Because it fulfills prophecy again. Number three, he must be killed. He has to be that, that's, that's a lamb of God that sheds blood for us. He must be killed. And then the last one is number four, he must ra- be raised again. And he can't be raised if he isn't killed. Must be raised up because that's the victory, the true victory over, over uh, death's grip on man, Right? So he must suffer, he must be rejected, he must be killed, he must be raised up. So telling this news too soon, um, as Glenn says, it would interfere basically with his mission. Earlier, I mean, I've kind of been coaxing this out of you a little bit by little bit as we've been going through this. Why does he withhold some of this information? Why does he not fully and plainly tell his, uh, his disciples early on? A lot of it has to do with strategy, right? Even though Peter made his confession right here, later what is Peter going to do? He's going to deny him. Now, this, all, the only explanation that makes any sense to this is the fact that this has to be the work of God in his heart and mind to, to kind of hold back his full understanding because the revelation of it was made right here in, in one of the other Gospels where this same um, account of Uh, Peter's confession is in Matthew is given he says flesh and blood did not reveal this to you but my father who is in heaven so there's a real declaring in this moment Peter is not just sort of guessing he actually has been given the insight of it by the father in that particular moment once this declaration is made then it seems like it's kind of pulled back just a little a little bit of a veil is placed over a cloudiness gets laid upon it 
to prevent them from going too far in thwarting the work of God. He literally tells us right here why these people keep going back and forth, back and forth. Because that, that's a question we always have, isn't it? Well, I don't get it. Didn't they believe? It said they believed, and now they're not acting like they believe. They just saw him do a miracle, and yet they're acting like he can't do a miracle. They just, God just gave them power and authority, but now they're not even trying to feed the, th- the thousands. Jesus has to step in and take it all over again. So we are acting like, you know, in our hearts, we're like, well, what is wrong with these guys? They're schizophrenic, right? They believe and then they don't believe, and then they believe and then they don't believe. Why? The only answer is right here. This is given to us in these verse 21 and 22. He warns his disciples, do not tell anyone about this revelation from God because I must suffer, I must be rejected, I must be killed, and I must be raised up. So basically he's saying, don't get in my way of my plan. There's an appointed time. So God protects the mission of his son by withholding full understanding until the time was fully right. Now this is the cool thing though, guys. Sometimes, you remember there's passages that say that, you know, basically you store up uh, your knowledge of God and of his word and that later the Holy Spirit will bring these things to, to mind. This is what I see happening here. Jesus is allowing them the experience of making these declarations, of coming to these revelations, of watching him do all these miracles, of witnessing it from the beginning of his ministry all the way through, so that when he dies, when the Holy Spirit does come upon them, the Holy Spirit then will illuminate the truth to them. They will have total recall of it then. It'll be crystal clear. And stuff they didn't fully even grasp hold of before will now make total sense. How many of us have had that happen in our lives? where we have looked at the word of God, we've been told sermons, we've listened to people tell us things, probably our mother a hundred times, right? (laughs) And we've done it to our children. Uh, But then all of a sudden one day, your daughter or your son comes home and says, Mom, my, my youth director told me this. And you're like, oh, how many times have I told you that? But all of a sudden the reality comes to truth for them. They, they connect the dots. Why? Because now the Holy Spirit is opening their minds to it. This is what's going to happen to these disciples after his death, burial, and resurrection. Right now, they're in a training g- ground. There's some of these insights that they are having, like where Peter has this big confession, but God's going to then kind of pull it back a little, put a little bit of a veil over it for them, and again, they're going to kind of struggle a little bit. But that doesn't mean there's not value in what they're experiencing along the way. When the fruition of what Jesus says he's going to do, suffer, be rejected, killed, and raised up, occurs, when they receive the the full empowering of the Holy Spirit, as Jesus tells them they will, then all of a sudden the recall comes. I remember when he told me this. I remember when he did that. And we have the written gospels to prove it. The full recall comes later. The full understanding of it comes later. We kind of look at these accounts and wonder what is wrong with them. It's because God was doing this. This was the work of God. He was holding it back. Later they're going to recall all the things that Jesus told them and put all the pieces back together, and the result will be they will have lives fully committed to the gospel and, and to presenting it. Pretty cool, huh? Okay, we got to hurry because we are way behind. 20, let's look at 21 to 27. And what happened there? What does Jesus do? Okay, so he warns them. He warns about... His cross, or suffering, right? And he instructs about theirs. You 
Now, we've kind of hashed this through a little bit, but this was interesting. He, this is where we see this statement in 9.27. It says, and some standing there will not taste death until they see the kingdom of God. Now, how many of you struggled through all, all kinds of interpretations as to what that meant, right? And what was being implied there about who's going to see it and when are they going to see it? How many of you actually used your inductive Bible study skills to try to draw a real conclusion on this? <laughs> I want to see, sh sh see how you did this. Yes, Martha. Very good. Excellent. Very good observation. So if you didn't catch it, now this is the danger in going to commentaries too soon instead of just allowing your own reasoning and the way that this is constructed in the text itself to give you the answers. Um, it's kind of like in uh, when you're doing a prophecy book like in Daniel, for instance, or, or even in Revelation, where they'll give you a vision, but then if you just keep reading, what's the next part? Interpretation of the vision, right? In this one, it's, you can really look at it in the same way. You see in verse 27, he says, um, I tell you truthfully, there are some of those standing here who will not taste death until they see the kingdom of God. And then it says, and some days, eight days later, then this occurred. So your answer is, what occurs in verse 28 to 36 with the transfiguration record of Jesus is the answer to who is it that's going to see and what is it that they saw that would actually fulfill that they would have see the kingdom of God how did they see the kingdom of God what did they see in that transfiguration record okay okay and he's also the Elijah is also the prophet, which would be the prophecies of the coming Messiah, right? So if you saw, which is, I, I have one of, the, one of my visuals that I got offline, it's a, a piece of art, shows the disciples kind of at the background, and then beyond them, in the midst of a cloud, there is Elijah and Moses on each side, and right in the middle is Jesus. So you have the law on one side, the prophets on the other, and right in the middle is what? Jesus, who is the coming what? king so pictorially imagery he got to see the the fulfillment of the coming of the kingdom of god it's all through imagery and they knew it i'm guaranteeing they knew it now here's um a couple of verses uh, some someone look up matthew 5 17 to 19 17 to 19 chapter 5 in Matthew. And you'll know this one as soon as you look it up. It's, it's obvious. Wow. Isn't that a, just an amazing, amazing verse in light of this particular passage? He said, I did not come to abolish the law or the prophets. I didn't come to abolish Moses' work or the prophets' work. I came to fulfill them. How did he uh, fulfill the, the law? He kept the law and he became the Lamb of God who fulfilled the temple works of the law, right? The th which, by the way... Everything in the temple and all of their feasts and holidays represented who? That coming king, that coming savior, the coming seed, right? On the other side, you've got the prophet that he was visibly seeing. And in the prophecies of the prophets, who was prophesied? The coming of the Christ, which is exactly why he said he, every time you turn around, he's fulfilling prophecy of some kind. So he fulfilled the law and the prophets, and there was the king, and they got to see this visual, this imagery. And for Jews, the visible thing is always the biggie, right? They want, they, they are a very visual uh, and so am I, so I must be Jewish at heart, because I love to, you know, draw it out or get a picture of it. I love my clip arts, because they just make me see it better in its reality. 
There you go. And the, not to mention the voice of God. It, very much like in the baptism, who, when he spoke out of heaven and said, this is my son in whom I am well pleased. This is very interesting. There's a couple things. Number one, he mentions this um, Zechariah verse, and, 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 uh, or I'm going to mention it. Sorry, they didn't mention it. I'm going to bring it up. Besides the Matthew verse, I want you to write down Zechariah 14, 16 to 21. And then couple that up with uh, Luke 933. 933, what is Peter's response when he sees these men with Jesus? Let's build a tabernacle. Build a tabernacle. Now, why do you think he said that? What was, again, okay, it's, it's all prophecy. Okay, ki- kind of, Yes. Yes, okay. You know what's really cool? In their system of, of worship, they have a day called the day of, Pente- or day of Tabernacles or Feast of Booths, right? What is one of the feasts that they are going to uh, uh, exercise in the days when the king comes? The Feast of Booths, right? Zechariah, I just gave you in 14 to 21, it says in that one that in that day, if they don't come up and and uh, exercise this feast of booths with them, God won't even let it rain on their land. And he he chastised Egypt in that particular prophecy. So what you know is that in Peter's mind, if, think about it, he's looking, he's seeing the law of the prophets, the come king. He's just saw the kingdom of God come. Jesus had just told him, you will, some of you here will not see death or taste death until you see the coming of the kingdom of God. So now he's seen the coming of the kingdom of God in a visible, a pictorial way through these three men standing shoulder to shoulder. And then he says, oh, let's build a tabernacle. So where has he just jumped to? All the way to the end of time where the kingdom is on earth again. He, but what did he forget in the middle where Jesus had to rebuke him? Uh, yeah, this part right here. He must suffer, he must be rejected, he must be killed, and he must be raised up again. Oops. <laughs> so Jesus has to correct him. The fact that he jumps so to this tabernacle, let, let me build tabernacles for you, is he really thinks, because he's seen the, ki- the coming of the kingdom of God in their visible presence, that, he, that they are now in, ushering in the kingdom of God. Yes, 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 yes. But isn't this just amazing, you guys, how many times the subtleties and all of these pictorial uh, or all of these records or accounts have to do with prophecies being fulfilled? So I would say be on your alert with almost every one of these from this point forward. If you're not sure about the full understanding of it, consider that it may be that he's actually fulfilling another prophecy. And do some Googling around to see if you can find where this does or doesn't fulfill some kind of prophecy. The idea of the tabernacling and the fact that he was wanting to build tabernacles and then Jesus had to rebuke him because he forgot about the cross he had just been told about. However, Jesus, I'm sure, understood what he did. He just missed a big period of time in history. He skipped the church age, right? He went right to the kingdom of earth, a kingdom of God come back on earth. Kind of makes sense, though, doesn't it? Now you can think, oh, why did he want to build three tabs? I've heard so many stories, so many explanations that are out there. Interesting. Yes. Because there's going to be the Feast of Booths in the kingdom to come. Yes. Yes. So if you go back and study the Feast of Booths and then go back and look at the, the prophecy in Zechariah that talks about in the uh, kingdom to come. And this is something, again, that the Jews would know about. Just like the Jews knew that when the king come, he'd be feeding his people. So when they saw him feeding the people, that was really super-duper profound to them. Not so much to you and I because we don't totally grasp it, but for them that was humongous. This was the game-changer for them. In the same way, they understand, because they know their prophecies, that when the kingdom of God is put back on this earth when Jesus comes to rule and reign on this earth we will be we will be celebrating the feast of booths it'll be a feast that we 
uh, participate in during that thousand year reign. And so Peter just jumped forward. He said, oh, let's get the boost going. <laughs> right? It kind of makes sense, doesn't it? Now that you kind of put the history there. All right. So we missed a whole lot. We missed... Um, yeah, Zechariah 14, 16 to 21. And it'll be on your notes when they come to you, so you, it, you'll have it. Um, Jesus healed a demon-possessed boy, and they marveled. And that's when Jesus then says, basically, healing comes with... Remember he says, um, you unbelieving and perverted generation. Now, he does not rebuke the apostles because they could not cast out the demon, Right? So whose fault is it that the demon couldn't be passed out or couldn't be ca uh, cast out? It was the unbelief of the person the miracle was going to be performed for. Because thus far, everything that we have looked at, every time a miracle occurs, Jesus says, your faith has made you well. It is because of faith that you are healed, right? Because Physical healing is a symbolic picture of spiritual healing. That's all it is. One day we won't have to have that anymore because we're going to have glorified bodies. But right now in this life, in this world, physical healing is a, is a symbolic gesture or picture of the fact that God will spiritually heal you. If you will not believe him, he won't do a healing for you. Are you understanding? Unless it's going to bring you into faith, or unless you are by faith receiving it, he's basically saying that here. He says, your faith has made you well, back in Luke 7, 50 and 8, 48. He said that through those two women. We just looked at in chapters uh, 7 and 8. So now in 9, he's complaining, Lord, your, your apostles couldn't, pa couldn't cast out this demon. Well, he says, he rebukes them. He says, you unbelieving and perverted generation. And so then what's interesting is he does this. He says, okay, he casts them out, right? But then he turns around and he says, okay. And, and by the way, what was their response once he cast out the, the demon from the boy? They marveled at him, right? They marveled. They're all just so excited. Jesus did this miracle. This little boy's healed, right? But guess what? The very next thing he says, warning, 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 right? He says, Remember, now, they marvel at me now in 43, but he says in 44, but later I will be delivered into their hands. These same people who are marveling at me are going to crucify me. And he tells this to his disciples. Did you catch that contrast there? If you didn't, make a note of it in your, in your observation worksheet. 43 and 44 are a contrast statement of the response of the people at the moment and what the people's response will be later. Okay, then he talks about the least in the kingdom. He who is not against you is for you. Just some practical points, right? 51 to 56, Jesus is determined to go to Jerusalem. Now, how does that relate to 57 to 62 where he's saying uh, those three responses by three different men who say, I'll follow you, I'll follow you. How does, how does the account in 51 to 58 relate to the next part? Why consecutively are those put in order? Yes, and because what does Jesus say in 50, um, is it 51, where he says he was determined, right, to go to Jerusalem? What's at Jerusalem for him? The suffering and death, the cross. And so the word determined, by the way, it means steadfastly set to fix one's face or to firmly decide. Make a decision and do it, right? Be um, cons uh, what is the right word? Be uh, absolutely convinced. And so then what follows it are three men who say they want to follow, but then they hesitate. They've got things of the world that are pulling them back, right? The Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. So really what he wants you to understand is if you're going to follow him, it's about self-denial. It's about sacrificial living. It's about potential hardships. Then the, in verse 60, he says, now allow the dead to bury their own. You, on the other hand, you go and proclaim the gospel of God. So following Jesus means having an urgency and a full dedication to proclaim the gospel. And then the last one, the last example is another man. And he says, no one after 
His hand is put to the plow, looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. That's in verse 62. What does that mean? Jesus is teaching them that following Jesus means an undivided heart, a single-minded commitment to God's agenda. I think about um, Elisha when Elijah came and got him and commissioned him to take his place. Do you remember that? And the idea of would he go back and can he stay and he got the cloak. And if you go back and look at that storyline there, it's a little similar to what's going on here. Jesus is literally saying, if you're going to follow me, you you put everything behind you and I become your your uh, your major thing. It makes me think of... Um, uh, the letter to the uh, uh, Ephesus you know, about having your first love. You know, they had left their first love, and he's saying, I am to be your first love. And so priorities. One, two, six again, you get the yes. Yes. Full circle. We're all the way back to, ch to chapter 1, verses 1 to 6, what he was trying to train them in. At the end, he says, now, if you're going to follow me, this is what is required of my disciples. So this whole chapter balances back and forth. Their cross, his cross. Their cross, his cross. Their cross, his cross. Did you notice? If you didn't, I hope you do now, because this whole thing is teaching us about the, the cross, the cross of Christ and the cross that you and I are to pick up and carry. All right, I'm like 10 minutes over, but 